Hi folks, task at hand on today's Wednesday widget. Help Jimmy DeResta with these giant razors. He's got them laser cut. What we've got to do though is machine a bevel on each side that's gonna prep them for finishing where they'll be polished and ground and sharpened. And what I want to do is ship Jimmy a solution. Kind of treat this like a turnkey project, something that can help him do a mini production run of these giant razors. So let's dive in. Welcome to their Wednesday widget. So here's what we came up with. Now there are a lot of ways to skin the cat here. And at the end of this video, I'll talk about a few other solutions. But what we've got is a 3D printed fixture where the angle holds the part at the correct orientation relative to the spindle to machine our bevel into it. The fixture has two holes on the underside that will host dowel pins that allow it to drop into the fixture plate on Jimmy's Tormach 440, which give it its locating accuracy and we've got this boss right here, which serves as our work coordinate system. A guy like Jimmy is super creative and he could easily cut this angle on a band saw or a table saw to hold the part of the correct angle. But what you don't always get with a sort of homegrown solution like that is an accurate locating feature like this that makes it really easy, not just to set up your work coordinate system, but again, when Jimmy's done with this project, he can go put this fixture on the shelf and he can pull it out in three months or three years and quickly remember how to set this job back up and run another batch of these. We printed this fixture on our Mark Forge. We found that it's been great for fixtures and work holding items like this. If you don't have access to a Mark Forge, plenty of other 3D printers or online services 3D hubs, Shapeways, and Zometry are three that come to mind that can easily and inexpensively help you make fixtures like this. We also laser cut a piece of acrylic, just a nice touch, makes it really easy to keep that machine nice and clean as you're running a small batch of these. Two strap clamps will serve as the work holding device that'll actually clamp down on the blade. We're just resting them in place now to get an idea of which holes we wanna use. And what we're gonna do is use a couple of nuts to secure these studs in place. And just a little bit of tension with a wrench will turn that stud into a captive stud. That way we can loosen and tighten the strap clamps without having to get a second wrench out to hold two things at once. Before we mount the first giant razor, we're gonna lightly secure down the fixture and use our Heimer to find the center of that coordinate system to set our X, Y, and Z zero. A quick sweep just to confirm within a few thousands as we walk across that face, plenty good. Again, this was really just a sanity check. Starting with a 2D adaptive, we are using a quarter inch stub five flute end mill from Lakeshore. I really like this tool. The fact that it's a stubby tool keeps it rigid. Five flutes means we can go a little bit faster on our feed rate, yet maintain the same chip load per tooth. It's got a 15 thou corner radius, which helps with our surface finish and tool life. And the price is right at under 18 bucks for a solid carbide end mill. Running at just under 4,600 RPMs, or about 300 surface feet per minute, and two thousandths of an inch feet per tooth, or about 45 inches per minute, with a 0.03 inch optimal load. We left five thousandths of an inch axial stock, and we'll come clean that up with a facing op to help give us a little bit better service finish. The runtime on these two alone is just over four minutes. That is a huge improvement compared to what Jimmy was running these at before, so that's a win. That being said, I know we could run this faster and harder, and he may well want to. A couple things that we could do, we could increase the feed per tooth to probably three thousandths of an inch feed per tooth, and we could increase that step over to 0.25 times 0.2% or 0.05, which will significantly reduce the adaptive cut time. Or we could probably just get rid of the adaptive and we could probably come through and do this in one single operation with a facing op. The reason we sent it to Jimmy this way is it lets him experiment. Not only do we have a roughing and a finishing operation, but 
he may find it's better to keep the tools separate, even if they're the identical tool. Depending on how many of these he's going to make, you may want to let your finishing tool only do finishing work. It'll stay sharper in better condition, and that can really help save time after the parts are machined when they're actually under hand labor, doing hand finishing, grinding, polishing, etc. The other reason to keep these separated into a roughing and a finishing operation is if you're using a hot rolled steel or some other material that has a harder scale on the outside, it's really helpful to have a one tool handle the roughing, get through that scale, and then again another tool just to do the finishing. The other way we could have handled this whole project would have been to use the side of an end mill instead of the face. In other words, instead of having the part held flat on the table like this, we could have rotated it up on its side, like so, and come down with the side of an end mill. If you were thinking about making a fixture using that side cutting or swarf style strategy, on the 2D contour operation in Fusion, under geometry, I've got a 0.75 inch tangential extension distance. That term is a mouthful. What that's doing is extending the toolpath 0.75 inches both before the cut and after the cut because you'll notice that the line that we selected is not really the accurate cut path because this line doesn't fully represent the length of distance we've got to cut, but rather this line up here would, so that gives us that extra distance. I've also run the toolpath 50 thousandths of an inch below our cut edge by using negative 50 thou axial stock to leave. That does two things. Number one, we need at least 15 thou of negative axial stock to leave because the corner radius of the tool. But we also will just get a better surface finish and avoid any sort of a burr if we ran that toolpath exactly at the same height. Now, for those of you Fusion 360 smarty pants out there, we could say Fusion 360 Expressions, which is the quickest way to get to this NYC CNC page, which has a very helpful cam expression called Tool Corner Radius. I'm going to copy that. And what I could have done, instead of typing negative 50 thousandths of an inch, I could have said negative and then paste that value in there and doing that would lower the Z height or the axial offset of the tool to negate out the corner radius. Again, I typed in negative 50 thou, but I like typing negative 50 thou to go a little bit deeper, and frankly, sometimes expressions are helpful, sometimes they're overkill. I will give the Fusion team a lot of credit because they did change the interface. It used to be difficult to remember and type these now. Type in tool underscore corner, I can see which one I want and pick it from the menu. So shout out for that. The reason we didn't go with this fixture is simple. It would likely be a better way to do it in many situations, but it's also a little bit more complicated, a little bit more difficult to get it dialed in, get it set up. Much easier to crash if you're jogging around or newer to CNC machining. And so that's something I would encourage folks to think about. Sometimes there are better ways to fixture things, but they may come at a cost that's just not worth it. This takes a hair longer, but it has that elegance of simplicity. Hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.